Hey! Are you all experiencing consciousness internally? Is interiority present, or are you merely phenomenological blobs of flesh with no interior experience? You know, the funny thing is that that answer is the answer. I used to get in, um, Daniel Dennett, you know, the philosopher, and I used to have a lot of fun arguing in front of audiences for money, and we found we got paid better when we were arguing with each other than if we were just saying whatever we were going to say. So totally capitalism, you know. And so anyway, <laughs> um, I my line back in the 90s with Dan was, um, the only way you can tell if there is actually an interior consciousness in a person is if they're a professional philosopher, and then they will tell you. <laughs> and I, you know, the funny thing about that argument, it's a, it's a laugh line, but it's logically as consistent as anything else in this space of ideas. I think it's probably true. And uh, so Dan does not experience consciousness. I love him anyway, that's fine. I'm not gonna be picky about this, you know? Like, I don't really know what's going on with the cats either. You know, it's fine. It's all good. Cats, philosophers, you know. Um, they both demand our resources, and we wonder, what exactly are we getting here? Um, however, what I wish to tell you about is, uh, in all sincerity, the, the position I've come to, which is through a different route, I suspect, than many in this room. Because usually when people think about these concepts of consciousness or is there a noosphere, what's really going on with the universe and what's the big picture here, usually we think about them as philosophy or as religion, as faith, as thought experiments, once in a while as science. I don't have the luxury. I make technologies. I, I'm like out there and we put this stuff out there and then the world changes, even if it's stupid sometimes. And so, for me, this is super pragmatic. So therefore, I have come to a position that I don't think was present in that little systemized ontology of ideas about consciousness from, from earlier. Uh, my, my position I will call pragmatic mystical dualism with an emphasis on the pragmatic, okay? Now, why? What's pragmatic about being a mystical, crazy person? Now, if you're in Berkeley, you should not have to ask that question. <laughs> However, I will pretend you did. It's even more important to ask it in Palo Alto, it turns out. Um, so, <laughs> there's this thing called tech culture, which is the ideas and the culture of the people who make our technologies. Uh, we're mostly men, we're mostly youngish, we're mostly pretty narrowly educated, we mostly live in the peninsula in South Bay, we mostly live in a world of pitches and startups, we mostly get our PhDs at Stanford and MIT, we are into science fiction, we're into all kinds of things. But one of the things we're kind of into is a certain kind of eschaton, a destination, a cosmic progression that's different from the Chardin one. Maybe, I mean, it's kind of hard to really be sure how all these things compare, as has been brought out many times today already. But the idea that I think is very present is one that comes a little bit more from the history of science fiction, in which AI is portrayed in certain ways. And I'm thinking of the Matrix movies and the Terminator movies and even, you know, old Mr. Hal from 2001. And the idea is that AI is turning into this new creature. It'll be smarter than us. And our job is to figure out how to talk to it really nicely so it'll like us. It's, um, now, um, what I want to say is that almost invariably the people who hold this particular region, religion, who have enormous sway, have not yet had children. Now, when you raise children, you learn that if you talk to kids to try to get them to like you, it will not work. But <clears throat> if you have not raised kids yet, it's a plausible theory, isn't it? It's a plausible theory. It kind of works with cats, but they don't actually know what you're saying, I don't think. Um, 
So there's this overwhelming majority of people who believe that, uh, including my friends and colleagues. Now, I should say, I have a bit of reputation for speaking um, somewhat with an acid tongue on these topics because I feel like I have to try to get through and it's hard. However, I don't say anything different to friendly audiences than I do to my friends who disagree with me. Uh, this is who I am, it's what I've been saying for 40 years, 50 years, God. Um, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, my principal mentor in computer science was a guy named Marvin Minsky. And Marvin is probably the person who did more than anyone else, except maybe Alan Turing, to promote this particular way of thinking about computers, that everything's computation, we're making successor, better computers than us, and maybe they'll be nice to us. But it's, it's a sort of a cosmic duty to make them anyway, and they'll solve all the problems, and it's the only thing that really, really matters, because with enough intelligence, all the other problems get solved. So it's in a way, the problem. Many people believe that. Many, many, still to this day. People I work with every day. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, so, uh, I used to love arguing with Marvin about this because I wasn't buying it. I always thought it was ridiculous. Um, Marvin loved arguing with me. I was the only one of his um, uh, protégés who just didn't buy it and gave him shit the whole time. Can I say that? It's perfect, right? I can, okay. Pardon my language, it can get a little salty. Um, so the last time I saw Marvin, he was dying. I went to see him at his house near Boston and um, a mutual friend called me when I was on the way. He said, oh look, Marvin's very frail. Don't argue with him about AI. I mean, come on, like, just give it a rest. So I, I showed up. Marvin's on the couch in this crazy room that has like circus trapezes and tubas and weird early computers and bizarre instruments under construction, all kinds of crazy, it's like, He's a wonderful, eccentric person. And he looks at me with this glint in his eye and he says, are you here to argue? <laughs> so we had the AI argument and it was great, it was so fun. So what is the AI argument? Well, <laughs> there's so many places to start this story. I don't even know how to begin. Um, among my students lately, who were almost all grad students from the you know, MIT, Stanford places, almost always, and they come in and they are really into this AI idea. They say, oh, we're gonna build the AI, the AI will solve the problems, this is our job, the AI is coming live, it's becoming generally intelligent, you can see it, it's almost there, it's almost there, it's about to do it. And so what I say is, okay, have you ever seen the, the drawings of an artist named M.C. Escher they say, oh yeah, of course, Escher, he does all that great geometry and all that stuff, and he was inspired by the geometer Coxeter. They all know all about Escher. You guys all know Escher, right? Yeah, okay. So you know how Escher is fond of images that can do figure ground reversals, where you can look at a bunch of, like a bunch of birds against a background, or fish. The background suddenly pops into being fish, and your brain can kind of flip back and forth. So I was saying, well, you know, I don't think we know the absolute truth about what's going on with our programs or our brains or reality or anything. I think we have to live with some uncertainty there. But I want, to, I want you to consider a very simple figure ground inversion. So one figure, let's say the birds, is the way you're thinking about it, that the AI is popping into reality as this new creature on the scene but you can invert it and it's not a creature anymore. And then they'll say, well, if it's not a creature, what is it? And the, the answer is interesting to me because the answer obviously is that it's a collaboration of people. Now, in order to explain this and whether you think this is a noosphere or not, I leave to Catholic scholars because I don't know if it is. Uh, I'm Jewish myself, and what we always do with these big questions is we punt. Like, on this question of, is the universe on the way to something? Well, we say, tikkun olam, we're repairing the universe. The universe exists only because of fragments, and we're repairing the fragments. But if we repaired them over the way, the universe probably wouldn't exist. It's like entropy. Like, if you have zero, it's terrible. If you have total, it's terrible. Somewhere in between is where things happen, right? And Will we ever get there? Ah, some Messiah someday, who knows, whatever. We don't talk about that. We just, and I, I like punting. I like Jewish punting. So it's different from the Catholics. They actually say, oh, no, no, we're going here. Okay. Okay, Paul, you go. You go do that. Um, anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, um, let's talk. Uh, in order to really talk about this, I'm going to get all concrete on you, and I'm going to tell you how AI works. And nobody's ever done that because it's, it's taboo. We don't explain how it works because that makes it more mystical, and then you give us more money. Every time one of you is mystified by current AI, I get to buy another instrument because it makes more money for me. Seriously, I'm absolutely not kidding. So I don't, in a way, it's not in my personal interest to explain to you how it works, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have too many demo instruments. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to explain to you how AI works in three steps. It's really easy. And once you get how it works, you'll see this figure ground inversion, and you'll see how it can be thought of as a new collaboration instead of a new creature. Are you ready? Ready, 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 ready? OK. We're going to start with a very simple question, which was a big deal until, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago or something, when it became obsolete as a, as a controversy. Can you make a program reliably tell a cat from a dog? Cats again. Why am I talking about cats? It's because cats are so popular on the internet, and the reason they're popular is they represent our receding independence. Cats, cats were not domesticated. They domesticated themselves. They can still live in the wild. They don't need us. They're just they're around for the kibble. They they know they know the game. They're not like dogs or cows or chickens or something. They never were colonized, so, and we we long to be like that ourselves. That's, this, that's our challenge in civilization, is to be cat-like. Therefore, they eternally are the mascots of the internet. But getting back to cats and dogs, if you're just looking at a picture, you can't observe the behavior, you can't rely on that, how do you do it? Well, there's a branch of math known as statistics, which is dealing with data and uncertainty. If you just take one statistic of an image, like how green is it overall, that will not tell you whether the image is of a cat or a dog, will it? If you take an infinite number and you can compare it to an infinite number of pictures, of course it will, obviously, except infinity is not available to us, so that's useless. I will, I will digress again. I will digress. One of my students here at Berkeley, at this very campus, a few weeks ago was saying, well, how can you say that AI isn't like people? Because there's this thing called Turing equivalence, which means that once you have a sufficiently powerful computer and it's not a very high bar to meet at all, then it can do all the same things as all the other computers. So why couldn't some other computer do the same thing as your brain? To claim anything else would be to claim something supernatural or so, right? I mean, it's math. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I want you to think about the number pi. You know pi? 3.141.1265358969. Okay, pi. I memorized that when I was like a little tiny kid and it's still stuck in there. I always wonder what better thoughts might be there if I hadn't taken them up with the digits of pi. But anyway, the question is, the pi digits never repeat. And what that means is that if you dig deep enough into the digits of pi, you can find every possible Turing machine implemented in every possible language, in every possible universe, in every possible variation, from every possible variation, from every perspective. Everything is in there. Pi has it all. Pi has all the brains that ever could be or not be or might almost be. Everything It's in there. Not very useful to us because we live in a world of costs and conservations and trade-offs, we can't get to all the digits of pi, obviously. But here's my question to you. Frequently, if you're in a math class, you are asked to divide pi by two. When you do so, do you commit genocide? <laughs> do you? And so I, as a mathematician, I have the delegated right to talk to pi. So I asked pi, how does it feel when you're divided by two? We're feeding back, should I, um, anyway. And Pi told me, I love the feeling of being divided by two. Do it, do it, I love arithmetic. Pi loves it. So I don't think we have to worry about all those brains in there. And I think effectively because of the problem of infinity, just because some hypothetical brain could be the same as your computer or vice versa, doesn't really mean a thing. So Turing equivalence doesn't bother me. But getting back to cats and dogs, are these digressions working for you? Is this too hard to follow? I'm kind of interested in pushing digressions so that we don't all lose our attention spans completely due to the smartphones. So I'm, I'm, this is good for you. 
This is like when I divide pi by two. It's good for pi. Digressions are good for you. They're good for your brain. Exactly the same thing. Okay. If we make not an infinite number of statistical measurements of a picture to tell if it's a cat or a dog, but let's say a few hundred, and they're just very basic, like are the lines more parallel in the upper right-hand corner or not, that kind of stuff. Will it work? No. No, that won't work. What if we make another layer of measurements like that, that then do measurements secondhand on the results of the first batch of measurements? Will that work? No. What if we make a big pile of them? We call a pile like that deep. If you hear about deep learning, it's like there are a bunch of those layers. No, not yet, but what? What if we show it a bunch of cats and dogs where we know what's a cat and what's a dog, and then we allow little extra numbers into those statistics to decide how important each result was. They're called biases. We'll, we'll, we'll like make this result a bit more important than that one and so forth. Then we pile all that together. That's called training, setting all those little numbers. Will that work? Yeah, that works. And that starts to work. It's crazy, but it works. But it's not crazy, because think about it. Statistics are valid math, and enough measurements organized in some way ought to be able to do it, right? I mean, it would be weird if it didn't work. The thing that's a bit unsatisfying is that we don't necessarily know why any particular bias has to be what it is. And if we do the whole exercise another time, it won't come out the same, and yet it'll still work, and it'll never work perfectly. But that's what we call a neural network. We call each of these little statistical measurements a neuron because we want to believe it's a brain. We really, 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 really want to believe it. So we call it a neuron and we call the thing a neural network. Is it like a biological neuron? Maybe a little. We don't quite know how those work. work. So that correlation is a bit of a work in progress. But anyway, we call them that. We call this thing a neural network. Now we can tell cats from dogs. Let's go to the step two. That's step one. Everybody get that? Do you believe it? I mean, it's what your phone does when it recognizes things. This is like totally, this is old by now. Um, it's not that hard to do. Now we're going to go to the next step, which is what we're going to say. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> just one other little digression. Have you ever been trying to do something important online, like schedule your COVID chat or something, and it says, oh, can you tell us if these pictures are fire hydrants or waterfalls, please? And you click them. We just want to verify you're really a human, that's all. That's you working for free for Google, training their neural networks. It's precisely what it is. It really pisses me off. I always hate it, but I have to do it. Um, anyway, what if you want to do more than cats and fire hydrants, and you want to do, like, everything? So then you take in the whole internet and everything else you can. That's why we scoop up so, 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 so much data. And you make an assumption that if there's some text that's adjacent to a picture, it has something to do with the picture, which is not always true, but it tends to be true. And then you do exactly the thing I just described for cats and dogs, except you do it for all the pictures everywhere, and you train them on the text they're adjacent to instead of on the specific categories like cats and dogs. And now you have a categorizer for everything on the internet. That's step two. Follow that? All right, step three is you run this thing in reverse, and here's how it works. I'm gonna do this for images, because I find it a little easier to see it that way, but it works exactly the same for text and music and computer code and really any other kind of structured data that we wanna do. Um, we're gonna start with a rectangle of snow, of random pixels, and we're gonna say, is this thing a cat or a dog? <laughs> or, well, let's just start with a cat. Does it look like a cat? And it'll give us a score. And it'll say, not really, because it's random. And then you'll say, well, I'm going to mess it up some more. I'm going to mix in some more snow. Did it get a little more cat-like? If it did, you keep that. If it didn't, you throw that change away. And then you keep iterating. <laughs> and then out of the snow emerges a cat that matches up. With the training, how what else could possibly happen, right? That's that's generative AI. Now, so far, all we've done is we've created an image that's similar to the images that it was trained on. However, where this becomes genuinely useful, and the reason this is such a big deal economically and socially, is that you can combine multiple targets, multiple criteria, 
and we will classifiers is the term we use for this. So if you say, I want a cat, but my cat's going to be on water skis, it's going to be playing a contrabassoon at the same time, and all this is going to be happening while it attends a conference about the noosphere at UC Berkeley. Can that happen? Well, every single time it plays with adding snow, it just sees if it checks all those boxes. And as long as it advances, you get that compound image. And that's generative AI. Uh, now, there's a couple of interesting questions to ask here. One is, is this thing really useful? Yeah, I mean, my favorite example so far is we've chopped 40% off the hassle of programming. And the reason why is 40% of programming is incredibly tedious and similar, but not quite identical to what people have had to do a million times before. So you can use the generator to make a version of the thing that's been done a million times before that matches the thing you're doing and save the tedious part. That works, it's great. It makes programming less um, dehumanizing, can I say that? So I think in that case, I see something kind of cool. Um, there's something I wish was different about it, which I'll get to, which is political and economic. How creative is this? How important is this? Well, those who say it's doing nothing new aren't quite right, because in satisfying the multiple classifiers, you can think of each of the steps that it has to build as being like a little tower that it builds up, getting closer and closer to a cat, closer and closer to water skis, and so on. And in order to get to them all at once, it has to fill in the space in between them. It has to come up with things that meet on both sides. And intrinsically, there's a kind of a problem solving that emerges of how exactly does a cat fit on water skis? How exactly does a cat hold a contrabassoon? And something comes out that doesn't violate the different classifiers, each of which is supported by a very large number of images. And somehow, in doing that, it has to invent solutions to bridge between the different elements that were used in the prompt. That is new. It's a new capability. You can call it creative. What it can't do is it can't build up beyond the gaps between those towers. So what I would say is it's a fill-in kind of creativity, but not a climbing kind of creativity. All right, and we have mathematical terms for that. When I say that, I upset some people. They say, how dare you besmirch the creativity and the potential of our AI? And I'm like, oh, come on, look at the math. Like, you know how this works. Like, let's just be honest with the people. What's there is amazing. It's really useful. We can also talk about how far it can go, which is not infinite. Okay, I have now explained AI to you. It's not a total or perfect explanation. It's probably about as good as your explanation for how a car works, which is good enough to get by. Um, you are now joining the 0.0001% of the population who've had AI explained to them. So congratulations. Now, <laughs> now here's the thing about this. And I, I, I spend all day trying to get this stuff to the world usefully. I'm called the prime scientist at Microsoft. This is what we're doing, you know? So um, I'm not opposed to the technology. I think it can bring good. I think it can be useful in a bunch of ways, and some of them are significant. I currently am of the belief that it'll pay for its carbon footprint, for instance, by making other things work better. I hope that's right, because <laughs> it's, it's got quite a footprint. Um, now, I talked about the figure ground reversal. In the figure ground reversal, what you see is that the whole thing is made of the data examples that went into it. Uh, one of the weird things about this generative AI, the current AI that everybody's excited about, is there's not a lot of code and the code isn't that hard or esoteric. Um, so when people say, oh, we're gonna open source our AI, I'm like there's not really that much to open source. The truth is this stuff isn't actually that hard. Like, I mean, my description to you it left out some steps. Like if I was describing a car, I wouldn't tell you what kind of metal you need to make a cylinder, but I've definitely left out some stuff, but it's basically not that hard. It's really all about the data and the data comes from people. And so here we end up with something extremely interesting Hey, actually, Terry, can I get feedback about something? How much time do I have? Am I going on and on, or am I within? I can go on more? OK. Uh, as Terry knows, I'm perfectly happy to go on and on and destroy an event. And we still have music to play, too. So if I'm destroying your evening plans, just say, hey, come on, guy. Give it a break. All right. So um, AI. 
Um, I'm going to offer to you a philosophical tool that I started using in the late 70s when I was really small, when I was a zygote. And I think I invented it, but it might have been co-invented by Peter Singer, the animal rights person. I'm not exactly sure of the timing. At any rate, it, at, I don't know exactly whether I started it and it moved over to animal rights or not. At any rate, it's called the circle of empathy. And you might have heard of it. Uh, here's how the circle of empathy works. Um, you propose a circle around you. It says, this is an abstract circle. Now we're back in philosophy. We're no longer going to ship this thing as a product, OK? So this is, this is easier, actually. We're going to put a circle around you. Everything inside the circle, you're going to decide, deserves empathy. So you don't bring rocks into the circle, generally, maybe some special rocks. But people are certainly in there. Then there are some things that are kind of at the edge. And there might be honest disagreements about where they should go. And these can include animals, fetuses for some, AI programs for some, and so on. Hmm? Can't hear you, sorry. Pi. Oh, pi, pi, the number pi. Yeah, well, the circle and pi have this conspiracy going. So you have to be really careful here, because they're like, um, and the circle wants to multiply pi times two, so it's going to really mess with your head. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> um, so the question is, well, if we're compassionate and if we're good people, shouldn't we want to just make the circle as big as possible? And that's the liberal impulse, I would say. The problem with the liberal impulse is at some extreme you become incompetent. So for instance, there are those who say, oh, I don't even want to kill a bacteria, but you cannot live without killing bacteria, and your teeth will get all grody. And so there's like some, like at some point, you have to just accept the buy-in to the inherent cruelty of the system you're part of on some level and just say, well, the parts that are the victims of the cruelty, I'll just say, are on the outside of the circle. Otherwise, you can't function. And there's maybe some other universe buried in pi somewhere in which that's not true. But anyway, in our universe, it is so. And it's one of the things that makes philosophy hard. Now, what about the conservative impulse to make the circle smaller? You can say, ah, let's get all these creepy, hippie, whatevers, <laughs> these weird computer scientists with their dreadlocks. They don't belong in here. Get them out of here. All right. Well, the problem with that is cruelty. That even though I think there's incredible incredible uncertainty about what's really going on in this universe. Is there consciousness? Is there a noosphere? Is this all going somewhere? All that stuff. We don't really get to know. I don't think we're privileged to find out. But I think there's some things that we can still hold on to, and surely kindness is one of those. And excessive conservatism, pulling in the circle too small, becomes cruel because you start kicking people out. Immigrants. I don't know. Like, you know, so you have to, it's a, it's a tough one. I don't think there's any absolutely perfect way to know where the circle should go. I think we have to respect to, to whatever degree we can differences and thoughts about where the circle should go. Anyway, tough, it's a tough topic. You know, like I think when one of the things I like about the circle of empathy is it forces you to confront how genuinely tragically difficult this universe is and to recognize that we don't have the luxury of getting it right and that we might hurt others in the course of trying to get it right, and then it's actually just really hard, but we have to do our best. So I think that's, that's our reality. Okay, should AI be in the circle or out of the circle? Um, according to this theory, the danger of making the circle too small to include AI is being cruel to a program. The danger of making it too big is becoming incompetent. Which is the greater problem, potentially, with AI? OK, I want to talk about the incompetence problem, which I think is very, very real. And there are many ways to go over this. Um, the practical one for our society right now is we use AI algorithms, an earlier generation than the one I just described, but fundamentally with similar qualities, to guide the minds of people online in their social media and video and everything. We have created the illusion that people couldn't possibly possibly, possibly navigate the complexity of the internet themselves, which is a, a falsehood, actually. There's a, there's a uh, cognitive lack of charity towards the human mind that's at play here. But anyway, the assumption is 
no way, no way, no way could anybody do it. So it has to be the algorithm that guides them. And the algorithm will optimize for them. It'll find the videos they'll really like. It'll find the friends they really like or the lovers. It'll find whatever. Okay. Now, I don't want to dismiss this entirely. I think in a lot of <coughs> small situations, in some bubbles, this actually works to the benefit of people. Um, an example I liked very early on when the internet started to work is people with rare illnesses finding each other who wouldn't otherwise. Fantastic. But there are many other examples like that. So finding good examples of this is not impossible at all. And I think there's a lot of good stuff. And dismissing it would be dishonest and in its own way cruel. But in the big picture, what we see is an almost uniform correlation with the use of these algorithms and psychological and social side effects from them that are really horrible. So what you see is a few years after algorithmic feeds show up for the first time in a country, you see their politics become more populist and uh, more violent and more internally divisive. When it shows up in a young person's life, particularly uh, girls, it makes their, it ruins their psychology. Is, is that too hard a word? Not really. The statistics are startling. Um, there are those who think that this is all bias and that people like me have created this illusion that it's worse than it is. I don't know. I mean, at this point, you could have said that when I was starting on this, this, this road of criticism, which was like 20 years ago now, but I think at this point it's been studied so much by so many people and there's so many whistleblowers from the companies and all that. I, I think it's pretty solid. I think we're doing damage. Um, I think the particular way we do damage is very algorithmic. Um, the human being is responsive to the environment in a multitude of ways. And I think just as with the circle of empathy, we have both sort of friendly and unfriendly ways of responding to our world. We can call them positive and negative emotions. It's a term sometimes used. Uh, the positive emotions are faith, charity, affection, trust, um, patience, hope. The negative ones are uh, fear, aggression, irritability, vanity, need I go on? All right, so these two things have somewhat different uh, paths in the brain. There's neuro a great deal of neuroscience about them. Um, but the interesting thing is that the negative ones are elicited more quickly than the positive ones. If you look at a person in a longer time frame, you'll tend to see a balance. People are approximately, according to most researchers who've looked at this, roughly balanced between their ability to respond positively and negatively to the world. However, the negative re responses come up faster. They're the twitch responses. They're the fight or flight. And since the algorithms are wanting their data, they respond to what you respond to faster. And so they naturally pull out the more negative ones to get you to pay more attention. And We've been working on this, and I say we, the whole, not me personally, but this is the Silicon Valley community. This has been known for a really long time, certainly over two decades now, probably like two and a half decades. And there's just never been a way to consistently avoid this trap and still be economically viable. Uh, so again and again and again, we keep on drawing people into crap. We draw people into conflict, into an inability to see the good in others, and we, we have this astonishing divisiveness. It's been used politically, opportunistically by those, I should start moving towards music, all right. It's been used, for instance, in the uh, Trump election, Putin's people used it to, to mess up America to some degree. It's impossible to know to what degree they affected events or the outcome of the election. However, certainly to some degree. Um, I'm honestly terrified of where TikTok is going. I'm honestly terrified of where this thing that owns the young people now is going. Uh, so um, we have incompetence turning to cruelty when we pull AI inside the circle. Let's go back to the Turing test, which was Alan Turing's proposal for you know computers are just other people. In the original thought experiment, you have a human judge who's being fed little messages, uh, tweets, you could call them now, um, from a person in a computer and has to decide which is which. And the idea is if the person can't decide, then you should give the computer equal rights. Rights, by the way, who were denied, that were denied to Turing, who was essentially tortured to death for being gay after the war, after being one of the greatest war heroes. 
So I think I think there's a tragic element to the Turing test that's underappreciated. However, let's look at the situation. You have three people, two contestants, and one judge. Two thirds of the contestants are humans, and humans are ready to make themselves stupid to make computers seem alive all the time. If you have a social media feed, you are doing it today. It's demonstrable, it's real. So there's a two thirds chance that the computers are not getting smart, but rather than the people are getting stupid. Therefore, the circle of empathy turns us against AI and prefers the, the other inversion where it's a collaboration of people. I only have a minute, but if you think of it that way, a very interesting bright future emerges where instead of AI displacing people, there are new roles for people who get praised and paid and fulfilled and appreciated for adding better data to the system in a multitude of ways into eternity. Instead of getting locked in what we've trained the AI for, you end up in an eternal creative cycle where the people are building the towers higher and higher for the AI to fill gaps between them. That would be a dignified future. Sometimes we call that data dignity. That's my talk. However, I'm not done because I'm going to play music. When speech stops, music starts. Music is wiser. Um, and here's, here's what I'm going to do. Let me introduce Mark Deutsch. Are you still awake after all that? <laughs> Mark, uh, Mark is, um, I, I've collaborated with Mark for decades at this point, and Mark has invented this instrument that you see next to him, and it's called the Bazantar, and it's a cross between a double bass and an Indian instrument like a sitar, so it's a bass with extra sympathetic sounds and buzzy elements and stuff, and so it's... Um, this big wind instrument is called a contrabassoon. They were popularized by Beethoven. It's the lowest wind instrument in the Western Orchestra. Uh, it goes as low as a piano. It's really great. And so there's this, there's this instrument called the Armenian Duduk. And every once in a while, I do weird instrument work for people's soundtracks. And every director, seriously, every director has asked the soundtrack composer, hey, I have like this especially wise character. Can you give me that sound of the wise instrument? And even though it's an Armenian instrument, I've seen it portraying the wisdom of an ancient Aztec shaman or a Chinese person or an alien. It's like the universal thing, but it's just that big. And I thought, I'm gonna see if I can play Beethoven's giant instrument in the style of an Armenian duduk, because this is the damn noosphere. This is not, some little alien getting a getting a, a cue on a soundtrack. This is the notes here. So we're going to do the contra bassoon. And I just need to soak my read for a second. Uh, but let's see if this works. This is a whole new thing. We haven't tried this before. You're going to hear this experiment for the first time.
Hey, thank you so much for listening to our experiment with very, very, very low notes. And uh, have a wonderful rest of evening. I'll see some of you, I'm sure. Great.